Hey y'all, welcome to our Tuesday class. Um, a couple of quick announcements just at the start of this. I have noticed that fewer of you have been attending the synchronous version of this class, which some of you mentioned to me at the end of last class was the result of you being unable to access the Zoom um, meeting room. And so if you... I will be posting a link to a regularly scheduled Zoom meeting room on the course site. The reason that I had refrained from doing that before is that when we start the Zoom kind of depends on how long these recorded lectures are. Um, but I will basically be setting the Zoom meeting for 11 a.m. every day and just know that our actual start time will be whenever this recorded lecture concludes. And so today we're going to have a little bit of a shorter one than usual, uh, or at least I think I'm just getting started. I don't know. Um, but in, in future, you know, typically these recorded lectures will be about between 30 and 40 minutes long, and you will just uh, join the Zoom meeting whenever you have finished watching that. So 40 minute lecture means we'll meet at 1140. Second thing is, I noticed that not all of you have turned in your intersectional masculinities review, and that is okay. As I have mentioned before, we're being flexible on deadlines at the moment because of everything that's going on in the world, and I know a lot of you have uh, difficult situations right now with internet um, or just with sort of lack of privacy at home or income concerns. And so it's okay if you haven't turned that in, but can you do me a favor if you're listening to this and you have not turned that in and you have not spoken with me about turning that in late, can you please get in touch with me by email? Um, you don't need to provide any particular explanation to me, but the university is asking us to go ahead and tell them about any students that are not engaging in course materials just so we can check in and make sure um, that there aren't any problems we need to address and so it would be very helpful to me if I have not heard from you if you could just contact me if you've been kind of uh, offline or if you haven't turned in that assignment okay so those are just our two announcements to start so when we do have our Zoom meeting today, um, we're going to be continuing our conversation about, well, I shouldn't say queer masculinities necessarily, because today's topic I don't think is exclusive to queer masculinities, but we are kind of transitioning from the documentary that I had you watch on Thursday, which was coming out under fire. Um, I hope you are all able to access this okay. I know that this is not a documentary that is specifically focused on the issue of masculinity, but I thought it's an interesting piece. Um, it was coming out right around the time Don't Ask, Don't Tell was um, being implemented. And it does have, I think, fascinating things to say about the presumed intersections between femininity in men, masculinity in women, and queerness, and how that collided with the expectation for uh, military service and military mobilization during the World War II era, which is an era that we're going to be talking about on Thursday of this week. So we're getting a little bit chronologically out of order here in the interest of going thematically. Um, I had some questions for you that I had you fill out on the worksheet for this last time, and I hope that we can start our Zoom chat today with me asking you some of those. But in the meantime, I wanted to just give you a little bit of a history, uh, a, a sort of post-history of what went on after this film, because World War II marked a really interesting moment, actually, in queer history. Namely, it's a moment in which the U.S. federal government essentially and unknowingly sponsors a mass migration of queer people to American cities. And the reason that this happened is, as the movie tells you, towards the end of the war, the government and the military started to put a great deal of energy into rounding up people that they suspected of being homosexual, which is not, you know, as the movie tells you, the same as behaving in homosexual ways or committing homosexual acts, but people that suspected of being homosexual. 
And when the military incarcerated these people and subsequently discharged them, uh, giving them blue or other than honorable discharges, what it often did was sort of drop them in the nearest port of call in the United States, which in many cases was San Francisco or New York. And so what starts to happen is all these people who are discharged are being dropped off in major American cities, sometimes with little more than the clothes on their back, not a lot of money. Uh, in many cases, they have no option to go home because there's always a possibility that their families are going to inquire about the circumstances of their discharge and you know, reject them for this. And so what happens is many of the people who are dropped off in American cities like San Francisco are going to remain there. And they're going to start forming a, a new kind of gay world. And among other things, that gay world is going to be a little bit different than the one that we discussed last week. Last week, I told you about George Chauncey's argument, um, and indeed the arguments of people like Foucault, Michel Foucault, that in the late 19th and early 20th century, homosexuality is strongly associated with and actually defined in many cases by gender inversion. There is an assumption that in order to be queer, you have to also be... Uh, if you are a man, feminine in some way, and if you are a woman, masculine in some way, either in your dress or in the sex role that you take on. And by sex role, I do mean sexual role, right? If you were the person being penetrated in a male-male sex act, for instance, you were assumed to be queer, but the person doing the penetrating was not necessarily, especially in working class communities. It was wholly possible to be thought of as a straight man and a masculine man and be some somebody that took on the masculine role in sex acts we would now consider gay sex acts. This is going to change, however, after uh, World War II, when there is going to be, in many queer communities, less of an emphasis on gender expression and more of an emphasis on sexual object choice as a qualification for gay or queer identity. And that does not mean, of course, that there isn't... Um, sort of a, you know, a butch femme culture or uh, a perseverance of a kind of fairy culture among gay men during this period, there are, of course, still people who consider themselves queer or homosexual who are gender inverts, so to speak. Um, but that is no longer regarded as a kind of qualification. At this period, any man who has sex with another man is going to be regarded in some way as queer, more than likely, and same thing for any woman, no matter how feminine she dresses. And so that's a shift. And you're also going to start to see the rise of a bar culture, which you read a little bit today in uh, one of our books, which is Liz Kennedy's uh, and, and, and Madeline Davis's Boots of Leather, Slippers of Gold, which is about sort of the butch femme dynamic and community in Buffalo, New York in the 1940s and 50s, or at least this particular chapter you read was. Um, bar culture is going to be a somewhat new thing during this period. It was very common in the late 19th and early 20th century for uh, homosexuals, quote unquote, or queer people to share spaces with other groups, including sort of... Uh, you know, people who would have been considered quote unquote normal at the time. So in concert saloons, dance halls, these sorts of things, um, lots of different people with different sexualities mingled together. In the post-World War II period, you're going to start to get some of the first real uh, gay bars that are designated as such. And the reason that's going to happen is, well, uh, twofold. One is you just simply have the concentration of gay people necessary to sustain a kind of queer economy uh, or an exclusively queer social business world at this point, right? You have enough people who are willing to go to bars, that the bars can stay open. And the second is going to be that during the Cold War, you're going to see a kind of um, backlash against gay people. Uh, McCarthy and sort of other House Un-American Activities Committee people uh, started to see homosexuals as uh, essentially vulnerable to blackmail from, especially in the government, as vulnerable to blackmail by uh, Soviets, essentially, um, because it was assumed that 
uh, if you were gay, then you must be deeply ashamed of that, and you would be vulnerable, and so you would be somebody that needed to be purged from the federal government because somebody could blackmail you into spying. And this kind of paranoia about the homosexual as un-American is going to filter down to all levels of society. And so in some ways, um, you're going to see the communist and the homosexual collapsed into kind of one group of being improperly masculine, questionable sexually and uh, gender wise, and that's going to necessitate gay bars simply for safety reasons. Um, so today you read two books that I want to frame our discussion around. One of those, as I mentioned to you, is Liz Kennedy and Madeline Davis's Boots of Leather, Slippers of Gold, The History of a Lesbian Community, which is about Buffalo, New York. Um, Liz, some of you may know, is a uh, U of A professor, so she teaches here at the University of Arizona. But she conducted this study from a kind of sociological perspective. She conducted interviews with a lot of the women who are very active in this community in the mid 20th century and she and Davis kind of recreated this community and what it looked like in the era before Stonewall and actually after she traces it all the way through um, they trace it all the way through and the second book is a little bit different it's less of a kind of social history and more of a book of theory and that's Jack Halberstam's female masculinity and I know um, I'm just going to address this at the start. Some of you might at times see this book as listed under a different author name. At the time that Halberstam wrote this book, um, he was presenting as and identifying as a um, butch lesbian. Um, that is, to my knowledge, not really the case anymore. Halberstam is trans identified and now uses he, him pronouns, although my understanding is that he kind of likes to float and occupy a relatively fluid space gender-wise. So I'm going to say he and him and Jack Halberstam throughout this lecture. Now, Halberstam's Female Masculinity is a really interesting book, and I think it's interesting uh, for our purposes because thus far in the class, we have discussed quite a bit about masculinity as a historical construct, how it changed over time, how different men, depending on their race, their class, their ethnicity, um, their abilities, uh, status, their uh, sexuality, have been able to access or lay claim to masculinity. But one thing that we have not really done is talk about masculinity as something that might belong to people who are not male-bodied or who are not assigned male at birth. And Halberstam, at the time that he was writing this book, was writing it in large part as a critique of that very trend in masculinity studies. So this book, Female Masculinity, was written in the 1990s. And that is really the period where, as I've mentioned to you before, masculinity studies was coming into its own as a field. But Halberstam had an issue with the way that that field was being framed and conducted. Um, and namely, the issue that he perceived was that Scholars, even as they were highlighting the importance of viewing, uh, of understanding that there are always multiple masculinities, that masculinity is constructed, that it's not historically consistent, they were nevertheless not looking outside of male subjects to study this topic. And so, among other things, in a part of the introduction that you didn't read for this class, Halberstam uh, sort of frames his argument as a critique of a text by Paul Smith called Boys, Masculinities in Contemporary Culture. And Halberstam excerpts the following passage from Smith, whose book in many ways uh, was one of the first to say we always have to be examining masculinity as masculinities, right? We have to look at the way that class shapes this. We have to look at the way that race inflects this. Um, and, and Smith really wrote what was in many ways a very intersectional text. And yet Smith also largely dismissed the idea that masculinity was something that needed to be examined in terms of women. And this is the quote that Halberstam includes from Smith. 
And it may well be the case, as some influential voices often tell us, that masculinity or masculinities are in some uh, reasonable sense not the exclusive property of biologically male subjects. It's true that many female subjects lay claim to masculinity as their property. And yet, in terms of cultural and political power, it still makes a difference when masculinity coincides with biological maleness. Now, that is in and of itself a claim, but it's a claim that Smith very quickly moves on from, right? Essentially, he said, yes, yes, uh, females or female-bodied people can also claim masculinity as their property, and yet it's just different when men have it, and so I'm just talking about when men have it. And Halberstam has a problem with this. Halberstam has a number of different critiques, one of which is, as some influential voices often tell us, well, who are these voices, right? Um, is there some hegemonic voice saying female masculinity is real? Because it doesn't seem like there really is, right? It's quite a marginal subject within masculinity studies, or it certainly was at the time Halberstam was writing. So who are all these influential voices demanding that female masculinity be taken seriously. However, on a broader level, Halberstam's critique is that this kind of formulation uh, is, well, twofold problematic. In one sense, it is rooted in what Halberstam considers an old-fashioned form of feminism, whereby women's experience is reduced to suffering at the hands of men, right? And so examining masculinity under this formulation just becomes completing a kind of archaeology or a history of all the ways that men and male-bodied people have oppressed women. And Halberstam says that this is a kind of... Uh, odd formulation, right? Uh, that this assurance that all men possess masculinity, that all men benefit from it, and that all women suffer from it is a very kind of regressive way of looking at feminism and looking at gender ideology. The second critique he makes, though, is that um, essentially this is not taking into account the any of the scholarship that suggests a a flexibility of sex categories, right? So for instance, we've read Judith Butler in this class where Butler essentially says gender is a copy for which there is no original, a facsimile for which there is no original. Um, and there have been other scholars, including lesbian scholars, who have made the critique that lesbians actually are not women and can't be thought of that way because they exist outside of the kind of heterosexual matrix that structures sex difference. And so... For Halberstam, all of these are points that would suggest that perhaps we need to be a little bit more capacious in our approach to who the natural subjects of masculinity studies are. If we cannot take into account that biological sex is fixed, if we cannot uh, sort of point to all men possessing masculinity equally, if we can't point to all women being oppressed by it, perhaps female masculinity is something that actually needs to be looked at and taken seriously. And so Halberstam's project in this book, which is uh, both a kind of personal narrative and a media critique, is that he wants to uh, essentially kind of rescue female masculinity from the dustbin of masculinity studies. Um, so Halberstam points out that part of the problem, part of why female masculinities are not taken seriously in scholarship on masculinity is, quote, female masculinities are framed as the rejected scraps of dominant masculinity in order that male masculinity may appear to be the real thing, okay? So this is an argument we've sort of seen before in this class when we've talked about Connell and the sort of hierarchies of masculinity, you're hegemonic, you're complicit, you're marginalized, and you're subordinate. Um, but what Halberstam is suggesting here is that essentially female masculinity has to be ignored, has to be treated as a rejected scrap in order that it looks natural for males to possess masculinity, that masculinity is so closely associated with men um, in part as a kind of tool of power, right? We, we don't believe it can convincingly be associated with anyone else. But Halberstam actually suggests something quite interesting and something that we might see as undermining the project we've done so far in this class. We have more or less um, 
I won't say taken it for granted, but at least studied scholars who assumed that in order to study masculinity, you look at men. But Halberstam is actually going to say something different. Halberstam is going to tell us that if you want to understand masculinity, you actually need to look at those quote unquote rejected scraps. In other words, you don't look at the successful quote unquote cases of it. You look at the masculinities that we deride um, or subordinate because those are going to tell you the most about how masculinity is actually constructed in society. And so as a result of this, and I just, I know you read this, but I want to highlight this quote. Halberstam says that he is not going to seek an understanding of masculinity by studying male subjects. Instead, quote, this book seeks Elvis only in the female Elvis impersonator, Elvis or Selvis. It searches for the political contours of masculine privilege, not in men, but in the lives of aristocratic European cross-dressing women in the 1920s. It describes the details of masculine difference by comparing not men and women, Women, but butch lesbians and female to male transsexuals. It examines masculinity's iconicity, not in the male matinee idol, but in a history of butches in cinema. It finds, ultimately, that the shapes and forms of modern masculinity are best showcased within female masculinity. Now, that is a big claim, and one of the things that we're that I'm going to ask you to engage with as we enter our Zoom talk after this is, do you agree with that? Um, what do you see as the potentially productive aspects of that approach? And as we have our conversation about Halberstam, one of the things that I would like to do, or points that I want to introduce you to or highlight for you at the very beginning, is that Halberstam, yes, is critiquing sort of academics for not paying attention to female masculinity, but he's also pointing out the kind of curious role of female masculinity within feminist discourse. Um, which, of course, is deeply influential uh, to the intellectual foundations of masculinity studies. And one of the things that Halberstam points out in his introduction is that he says um, female masculinity is a kind of curious, a site of curious confluence because social conservatives and um, ostensibly kind of leftist feminists in many cases agree that there is a kind of delegitimacy that accompanies female masculinity. Um, conservatives, because they understand that um, masculinity should map only onto male bodies, right? That women are not naturally uh, masculine, that women should be feminine, that they should fulfill a distinctly female sex role instead of gender expectations. And feminists, in some cases, particularly sort of second wave feminists or radical feminists, can sometimes uh, read female masculinity as a kind of internalization of the patriarchy, an attempt to replicate heterosexual norms within queer relationships, etc. And so, for instance, as scholars Catherine Highstand and Heidi Levitt noted in a 2005 article on butch identity, quote, with the advent of the second wave of feminism, a butch femme couple was seen as mimicking and embracing the very type of gendered relationship that proponents of the feminist movement sought to abolish. During the 1970s and much of the 1980s, butch and femme identities became all but invisible behind the androgynous aesthetic that was more coherent with the feminism of the time. And so you have this idea here, and I know that this idea still exists in some cases because I've had friends who have commented that they've heard comments like this about sort of being butch. Um, but the idea is that butch femme couplings are essentially failures of the queer imaginary, that they are just uh, conservative attempts to mimic heterosexuality instead of imagining the possibilities of queer expression outside of a heterosexual model. And this is, of course, female masculinity um, as queer masculinity, right? This particular formulation of the butch femme coupling. But I think there are any number of feminists who see masculinity in and of itself as a kind of uh, form of aggression, um, as something very negative, as something that should be kind of purged or rejected rather than embraced by 
women or by anyone. And so one of the things that Halberstam is kind of critiquing here um, with this book, Female Masculinity, is not just a kind of academic rejection of female masculinity, but a tendency to say that female masculinity exists in or occupies a rather strange place in feminist thought as well. Um, and specifically, again, this notion that um, embracing a masculine identity, if you're a woman, is just trying to be a man or otherwise trying to embrace a kind of patriarchal idea, trying to gain dominance through an embrace uh, or an attempt to imitate men. And Halberstam obviously is going to disagree strenuously with this particular interpretation of female masculinity, but I'm curious as we have our conversation, which we're going to segue into in just a moment, what you think about that, how you have encountered discussions of female masculinity and some of your own courses on, if you've taken courses on feminist theory or feminist thought, um, I'd welcome hearing that. And I'd also, um, one of the questions I'm going to pose to you as we transition to talking about Kennedy and Davis is, what do you think they would say about this formulation that butch femme couples or that masculine women are trying to imitate a kind of heterosexual model of relating to one another or trying to kind of embrace patriarchy in particular ways. And furthermore, and this, you know, is a, is a question for our conversation, but if we divorce, if we assume that Halberstam is right, that men are not the only, the primary, or even the natural subjects of masculinity studies, that in fact, um, in a sense, they're sort of, especially when they're hegemonically masculine, the least desirable subjects of uh, masculinity studies. Um, how do we define masculinities then? Um, what is masculinities if it is, if they are not assumed to be uh, roles that map onto maleness, or if they are not assumed to have an inherent and natural relationship to male bodies, how do we go about defining it? Now, that's just a small question, obviously, but hopefully we can, uh, that was my sarcastic voice, by the way, it's an enormous question, um, but hopefully we can talk about that as we transition to our discussion. So at this point, um, what I'm going to ask you to do, and we'll go over a few more slides, is... Um, transition to our Zoom chat. So as you finish this, go ahead and log into our Zoom meeting, and we'll talk both about coming out under fire and these texts that we read for today. Okay, see you there.